Good morning. Would you stand and join us as we worship the Lord together in this place today? God, we just come to you today saying that you are our king. God, we want more of you in our lives. Lord, we want to uh, hear your voice. We want to be led by you. We want to honor you and please you with our lives. Lord, may that happen today in this place. Lord, may you uh, be, be pleased with the things that are said, done, the thoughts that we think today, Lord, um, the uh, messages that we hear. God, would you open our hearts and our minds Lord, would you help us to just position ourselves today, uh, spiritually speaking, in a place, Lord, of, of reverent submission to you. Lord, we love you, praise you, and thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. So great to have you here this morning. We want to welcome you. If this is your first time to uh, be with us today to attend, then we want you to pick up a gift at the uh, Welcome Center and info packet that's there. And so uh, thanks for doing that. I want to let you know about a couple things that are going on today, a real special uh, opportunity here in the next little bit for uh, Keely and Trevor. They have a uh, drive-by shower. I don't know if it was supposed to be drive-through. I said drive-by. I may have changed that. But anyway, uh, drive-by shower, um, and uh, you can and give, that, give a gift or congratulations to Keely and Trevor on the south side of the church. And uh, 9.30 to 10.30, the idea is that if you're here at first service, then you can go uh, after the service and you can um, see them and, and do that. If somebody's coming to second service, then they can come early and do that as well. So a creative way to uh, be able to encourage Keely and Trevor, and so we hope that you'll do that and um, uh, just take advantage of a way to encourage them. 
on another note of congratulations, here's a picture of Matt and Amanda Creech. And so uh, this Matt is, the, of course, the son of Jim and Pat, grew up here in our, this church and part of our youth ministry and active uh, through all of his years uh, growing up and in high school, but married on June the 5th, Matt and Amanda were. And so uh, as with many weddings lately, um, obviously having to change the original plans just a little bit. And so we're excited for Matt and Amanda and hope that you'll find some ways to congratulate them, even if it's through Jim and Pat. All right, don't forget our VBS neighborhood um, opportunities that we have. We still need volunteers, whether you would like to host a VBS or if you would like to team up with someone else who is already doing that. And so uh, see Kristen. She's got packets, of course, that have uh, supplies for crafts, for the lessons, for the snacks and everything. And so uh, once again, it's flexible so that you can decide if you want to um, have that on uh, one big day, all day, or all weekend, or if you want to do it every Wednesday or every Tuesday uh, for the rest of the summer, or if you decide that there's a certain week in July uh, that you'd like to do that, then uh, that would be good, and uh, you can work with any of those things. Kristen will just want to give you all of the information and um, all of the supplies that you'll need to make it easy as possible for you. So, um, anyway... Again, we thank you for being here today. Um, I'm going to uh, do one more thing. You guys have been really good. I've only had a few people cover their face and then two really honorary staff members that wore masks one Sunday for me. Um, but we just want to know that you're here. We're not going to post this on social media, but uh, since um, I'm going to mix it up just a little bit and I'm going to start over here. So everybody either wave or smile at me and uh, thank you for being here today. Section one, and then we're going to do this section right here too. Everybody smile. Jeez, that's good. <laughs> That's good. No bunny ears on brothers over there. So, all right. And in this section, one, two, three, and in our final section, awesome. Great job. Thank you so much for being here today. We're, again, we're not doing our meet and greet, but why don't you turn around, wave at somebody, and uh, welcome them to church this morning. Yeah, you can stand. You can wave both arms if you want. <laughs> so... It's good to see each other today and to uh, be able to know that we're the church, uh, regardless um, of all the other uh, hoops that uh, sometimes we feel like we have to jump through. So why don't you stand and, and uh, let's worship together. If you'd like to uh, echo with Cassie, then we invite you to do that on this song as we consider the worthiness of our God. Do you feel the world is broken? shadows deepen we do do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all made new we do it's all creation grown Jesus 
our Messiah hold forever those he loves. He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. the grave. He is David's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, and every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor?
ever seen Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you church. Uh, join me now as we enter into our time of prayer. Uh, Father, uh, we are so grateful uh, to be gathered as your people, uh, to come to worship such a great and holy and perfect God. Uh, Jesus, you are worthy. Um, you have paid the price to ransom your people, uh, and I pray that we would live a life worthy of that. And as we turn uh, to these requests, God, I pray that our hearts would be aligned uh, with your will and with your kingdom, uh, and that we would eagerly pray uh, for that to be established. And now, most of us know somebody either in the hospital or who has surgeries coming up or needs a surgery or is at home. And uh, if you would take a minute, just uh, lift them up now. As a church, we've also been impacted by um, a few deaths over the last couple of weeks. Uh, so lift up those families uh, that are going through uh, that time of grief. We also want to lift up our nation, all of our leaders. Uh, certainly, so much turmoil going on, and uh, now's the time more than ever that we need uh, godly wisdom uh, from everybody uh, in a place of leadership. Our normal routine is to lift up one of our missionaries every month, uh, but I think we should pray for all of them today, um, especially with the pandemic and everything. Uh, their lives have been turned upside down, probably more so than ours, uh, so pray for them. We also usually pray for another church, uh, but I want to pray for the global church. Uh, pray that we would be united uh, and Christ's light would shine brightly through us in our love and our unity. We also want to continuously pray for the lost. We all have friends and loved ones uh, who need to know Jesus, uh, so pray for them. Father, again, we thank you so much for who you are. Uh, we're so thankful to come to a God who hears every one of our requests and again we pray that as your people we will be aligned uh, with who you are uh, with your heart and that we would have your eyes and your ears and we would be a bright light uh, in our community uh, we love you and it's in jesus name we pray amen word jared will be preaching from uh, 1 Corinthians 23 and following. Now I call upon God as my witness that I am telling the truth. The reason I didn't return to Corinth was to spare you from a severe rebuke. But that doesn't mean we want to dominate you by telling you how to put your faith into practice. We want to work together with you so you will be full of joy 
for it is by your faith that you stand firm. So I decided that I would not bring you grief with another painful visit. For if I caused you grief, who will make me glad? Certainly not someone I have grieved. That is why I wrote to you as I did, so that when I do come, I won't be grieved by the very ones who ought to give me the greatest joy. Surely you all know that my joy comes from your being joyful. I wrote that letter in great anguish, with troubled heart and many tears. I didn't want to grieve you, but I wanted to let you know how much love I have for you. Thanks. You can be seated. Thank you, Brandon. Um, I got in his head this morning, and he accidentally said 1 Corinthians, and I told him that I thought I had done the exact same thing, so I think I set him up for failure there. Uh, We're in 2 Corinthians today, and we continue through this series of Heart to Heart. Uh, that we took a break from last week with Father's Day, but Brian's preached a few weeks now in 2 Corinthians, talking about this heart-to-heart that Paul had with the church at Corinth. And as that happened, uh, he was explaining a little bit about the change of plans that he had had, that that Paul was uh, planning on going to Macedonia and on his way to visit Corinth on the way there, and then to also visit them a second time on the way back. And his plans had changed, and the problem was is that uh, that the people at that time started to take that as an opportunity to question Paul's character. To say, are you going to do one thing or say one thing and then do another? Can we trust you at all? And, uh, and he, Paul explains and defends himself that you can trust me. There's, there's reasons why I had to change my plans. And so in this section that we're going to look at today, and as Brandon just read, we're going to look at some of his reasons and his heart for why he changed his plan. But doesn't it, in a culture like we're in right now, in times that we're in right now, seem a little bit unreasonable to uh, get worked up about somebody changing their plans? I mean, after all, haven't we all had to change our plans over and over again over the last several months? I mean, who among us hasn't had a plan of this is what I'm going to do, this is where I'm going to go, and it's changed for you? Maybe it was a vacation that you had planned on taking. Maybe it was a surgery that you had scheduled and all of a sudden it had to be postponed and you put it off and the anxiety, the um, anticipation of that got put off. For some of you, it was a wedding that was changed. And I know in our family that was the case. And so you adapt and you, um, or you wonder if it's going to change, right, Keely and Trevor? You, you wonder, you've wondered that question for months. Are we going to be able to do what we've planned? And so uh, we are definitely aware of the idea of changing plans. And yet Paul, as he talks to the church at Corinth, is recognizing that some people have been saying some things about his change of plans, and he wants to explain it. And so today, as we look through this section, we're going to see his heart for heart to heart as he reads the room, the heart of why he was changing his plans. I wanted Brandon to read from the New Living Translation because I like some of the wording that's there, but also from the uh, English Standard Version the ESV. I'm going to uh, read this again. And as Paul starts to make this defense of why he changed his plans, it might seem like a strange thing to preach from. Why would Paul change his plans so many thousands of years ago, and why would that matter to us today? But the heart for why might be something that we can connect to. And so if you want to follow along either in your pew Bible, which is in the New American Standard Version, or uh, to follow on on the app or your Bible, verse 23 of chapter 1, 2 Corinthians. And Paul, it's as if he stands in the courtroom. And he goes up to the front of the room and he, he goes up to the stand. And it's as if he puts his, maybe his left hand on the Bible and his right hand in the air as if to say, I'm about to tell you the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God, right? In other words, you can trust everything that I'm going to say. You may have questioned my character. You may wonder if you can trust what I'm going to say, but I'm telling you, this is, I'm holding nothing back. And in fact, the language that Paul uses here is as if he says, God, deal with me if I don't, right? I'm going to tell you the whole truth, and God, you deal with me, and you discipline me if I don't tell all the truth right now. And so he shares his heart, but I call God to witness against me, verse 23. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. Not that we lord it over you, over your faith, but we work with you for your joy. So you stand firm in your faith, for I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. For if I caused you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? 
And I wrote as I did so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from all those who should have made me rejoice. For if I felt sure of all of you, that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. And so Paul, as he shares his heart, he's saying that God is my witness. I did it for your own good. I did it so that I could spare you from what the New Living Translation says is a severe rebuke. That I would have to straighten you out from some of the things that have been going on in the church. But so... He, he says, here's the why. First of all, I did it to spare you. I did it so that I wouldn't have to come and basically put you back into your place and to really get on to you. It wouldn't be one of those negative, just talk down to you, set you straight kind of conversations, which we all like to avoid, don't we? Those aren't fun. And Paul says, I don't want to have a conversation like that, so I'm writing that and I'm changing my plans so it would spare you from this rebuke. Verse uh, 24 says that the other reason that he decided to change his plans was because he realized almost the language of a sparing them from a severe rebuke is as if he's talking down to them, right? And Paul, being in the position that he was in, might have had some claim to be able to talk down to them in the sense that he felt like he had some authority. No, he wasn't one of the original 12, but he was kind of becoming known as the, the apostle to the Gentiles, right? Right? And so, yes, he was in a position of leadership and authority that some might have said, Paul, you have every right to speak authoritatively to the church. But it's as if that phrase in Paul's mind that I would spare you from severe rebuke caused him to say, you know what? It's not about me talking down to you. It's not about me pounding my fist upon a pulpit and talking down to you, but I want to come alongside of you and sit next to you and put my arm around you and remind you that we're in this together. We're walking together through this life and and, and we walk toward Jesus together, arm in arm, day by day. And I'm no different than you, Paul says. I want to work with you. We want to partner together as we try to do this work for the Lord together. And so he said that he wrote to spare them, but also so that he could express this idea of laboring with them. But then the third thing that's mentioned here in this section is that he wants to be able to rejoice with them. To be able to know that the connection that's made between Paul visiting the church and the emotional experience of the whole thing would be a positive one, right? We've all had those experiences whenever we had a visit, maybe a lunch with a friend or maybe it was family time that we had. A trip that we took and the tone that was remembered wasn't positive, right? Maybe you've had some of those and he, Paul wanted the connection. For me, whenever I'm visiting you, I want it to be a positive remembrance, Right? I want it to be something where we could rejoice and we could celebrate together. Uh, this is not in my notes, but I was just thinking that our kids, whenever we think about the road trip that we took to California many years ago, we saw some amazing things. We did a little side trip on the Grand Canyon, you know, just a little side trip over there to see one of the greatest wonders of the world. We did all these crazy things on this trip, saw so many amazing things. And you know what they think of a lot is that, man, it was hot. We don't have rear air in our vehicle. And so they were always saying, turn up the air, turn up the air. And that's what they remember is that it was hot and uncomfortable the whole way to California and back, you know. Paul's saying, I don't want it to be a memory like that. I want it to be something that whenever you think about me visiting, it's rejoicing. It's celebrating. It's a positive experience. And so Paul says, that's the reason. That's the reason that I didn't come to you. That's the reason that I changed my plans. But why, was, why did I do it ultimately? It was for your good. It was for your good, not mine, because I could have come. And don't, don't we sometimes feel good about just really telling somebody something like it is? <laughs> you know, sometimes there's that feeling that beforehand you're just, you know, welling up and I'm just going to tell it like it is. And then we think that's going to feel really good. So we look forward to that. And then sometimes afterwards it doesn't feel so good. But the point is, is that it wasn't for his good. It wasn't for Paul's good. It was for the good of the people of the church. And because of that, he realized that it's not the right time for me to come. It's not the right circumstances for me to come. And so I'm going to write to you instead. And then maybe later I can come under better circumstances. And that's why Paul shares with them. He says that it was, it was for them. But more specifically, it was for their joy, not their pain. It was for their joy, not the New Living Translation says, but not for your grief. I don't want to grieve you. I don't want it to be something that you're sad about, something that pains you but I want it to be for your joy. 
But he says, I also want to come, and, and it's for your sake, it's for your faith. He says, you know what, you stand on your own faith. Whenever you come to God after this lifetime, it's not going to be that you're going to be accepted because sermons that you heard, right? Either from a stage or from a conversation or from the phone call. It's not going to be because um, somebody convinced you, uh, because they set you right, they set you straight. It's going to be because you accepted it. And that's what he's telling the church there is that it's your responsibility, your faith. And so if you're going to stand before God, then it's going to be on your own, not because I made you do it. And so he says that it was for your faith, not by force. And it was for their love, not their anguish, not their pain, not all of that hurt. And so that's why Paul changes plans shortly. But what does that mean for us? I was thinking back just a little bit about uh, an illustration several years ago that I heard in youth ministry that was used and it still stands today. It was the difference for Christians of being a thermometer or a thermostat. Have you heard that? You probably make the connections yourself with this analogy. We've gotten accustomed to these, haven't we? Especially ones, if you have one, that can shoot, shoot the little temperature and find out what it is without even touching uh, anything. But that the difference is, is that a thermometer is one that will tell you that your temperature, right? It'll tell you your temperature if you have a really nice one. It might even be able to tell you the surface temperature of something. It might be able to tell you the temperature of the room. But it tells you your temperature, but it really doesn't do anything else, right? This uh, apparatus, this mechanism will not call the doctor for you. It will not take aspirin for you, right? It will not uh, drink Gatorade or self-quarantine for you or anything else. It's just telling you what the temperature is, right? It's as if it shouts to you, you've got a fever, you've got a fever, you've got a fever, right? Or you're okay, you're okay, you're okay. <laughs> All it does is tell you. It doesn't do anything about it, it just tells you that. But the difference is, is that as Christians, we're supposed to be a little bit more like a thermostat, right? That it would be able to do something to enact change based on the temperature. That as a thermostat would be able to uh, recognize that, oh, it's getting a little bit cooler, and so let's send the signal to the heater to kick on. And maybe uh, um, if you've got, I don't know if there's thermostats out there that are so good that you never have to change them throughout the year, you could just set it for the whole year and heat when it needs it and cool. Uh, we don't own one quite that nice, so I'm not sure. But the point is, is that it's able to do that because it does. It reads the temperature of the room, but it acts upon it, right? Right? And as Christians, we need to know the temperature of the room, so to speak. But then we can't just know it. We have to do something. We have to act in our faith and do something about that. A few years ago at Christmas, we had trouble with our thermostat. In fact, we had gone to Oklahoma City right after we had opened presents and everything on Christmas morning. Or maybe it was the day before. Sometimes we've had to do that, and you may have too. And uh, we left and set the temperature and, and, and came back days later, days later, to open the door and just get smacked in the face with hot air. <laughs> and we walked in the house and immediately knew something's wrong. It was as if it was shouting to us, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. And we didn't know what. We got to the thermostat and we immediately tried to shut it off. And I don't remember what it took to get that off, but it was obvious that something had gone wrong. In fact, I remember calling you, Chuck, and saying, what do I do? And you said, I think it's your thermostat. Yeah, because it was reading like 90 degrees or above in our house in December, right? And so we didn't know what was going on. It was so hot. We opened the windows up, and this is evening, so we didn't have much time to bring the temperature down before bed. And so we opened up the windows and turned on our attic fan and tried to bring in all that cool December air so that we could finally get it to a place where you could tolerate it and not sweat in December. And there was something that was wrong. And so we're going to have to try to figure that out the next day, but for that night, we were just trying to be able to sleep. Let me tell you, it was so hot in our house that the walls radiated heat. When we finally got the temperature down just a little bit, it wouldn't stay down because the walls just to the core of our house was hot. Thank you, Lord, that nothing worse happened, right? Um, I don't know what kinds of biological dangers there are with that. Maybe that's the reason why I'm strange today is because I slept in a house like that um, one night. I don't know. But the point was is that something wasn't wrong. This thermostat wasn't doing its job. It was interesting, we had stocking stuffers that Christmas that were these, those little uh, Lindor chocolates, you know. They were all in a puddle, seriously. Um, something wasn't right. 
And whenever these things don't work right, then life is not as, as good as pleasant, is it? And so I think what Paul is saying here is similar to this illustration that Christians and even Paul himself was trying to be more like a thermostat than just a thermometer. And that he would read the situation, he would read the room, he would read the temperature of the room, and that he would respond accordingly. And you know, sometimes that asks us to do different things, doesn't it? Sometimes, whenever we read the room, so to speak, whenever we see the relationship that we have, or we understand the season that's going on in parenting, whenever we understand that maybe we've been uh, hard on someone and we've been critical, then maybe it's time that we react in a way that's in their best interest. Maybe it's that we've been too easy and we need to be a little bit more firm, a little bit more tough. And so sometimes when we read the room, it causes us to respond in a different way. And I think that's what Paul's saying here is that I read the temperature of the room in Corinth in this church and I'm saying, I realize that I've been tough on you and I realize that there's still more that needs to be said. There's still some tough words that need to happen. And so I'm gonna send in a letter so that someday I can come and it's gonna be a whole lot more pleasant. But for right now, I'm just going to stay away. I'm just going to react in a way that's in your best interest, for your comfort, for your blessing. And we're gonna find out as we go through the book of 2 Corinthians that I think it was a good call that Paul did that. The response was positive and it was for their benefit. But how often do we need to do that in our own lives? That we would read the temperature of the room. And sometimes that calls for a rebuke, doesn't it? Sometimes it calls for a severe rebuke. I remember that whenever I was in uh, my senior year in high school, I had um, gotten a first year teacher with a bunch of my friends. She was down in the freshman wing of the building and everybody knew that she was a first year freshman teacher, but she had one class of seniors that just totally made her life miserable, right? We all had senioritis and we weren't taking anything seriously, but she wanted to be our friend because she was close to our age. She was a first year teacher. But by second semester, she realized, she read the temperature of the room and said, I don't have control over this class. And so finally she tried to respond and it was too late, you know what it was like. We all had just a few months to go before we were graduate, uh, graduates. And so sometimes we have to read the room and realize that it's time to get serious. And for a first year teacher, I believe that's in the first few weeks of class. And sometimes that rebuke, uh, that response that happens isn't just a rebuke, it sometimes it needs to be compassion and care. Um, I've said this before, but my fourth grade uh, year in elementary was one of the turning points of my life. And for you, maybe fourth grade was inconsequential. Maybe it didn't mean a whole lot to you. But my fourth grade year, I was trying to figure out who I was. And my parents knew it because I was just a pain to them over and over again. I was a pain to my teacher. And she was talking to my parents over and over again about things that I had done wrong, fights that I had gotten in at school, homework that I hadn't done. And it was really a gut check for me to be able to say, who are you going to be? What direction are you going? And I know that that year I got in trouble so much, I got grounded, I probably got spankings. I know that I, it's quite possible that I got my mouth washed out with soap because that happened a couple times growing up, right? It was tough. Um, but I also remember that it was as if that year my dad had read the temperature of the room of his son. And he said, you know what, I've been, I've been riding you hard because it's been a tough year. But maybe a different approach would get through to him better. And so he took me to uh, Shannon Springs Park, and I went and visited this park with my mom uh, back in, in September. And I looked at that park because that park brings a lot of memories to me. That's where my dad took me whenever he wanted to tell me about becoming a Christian. And he drew out on a piece of paper that stairway to heaven and that highway to hell. And he talked to me about what it means to be a, a Christian. But that day, he took me to Brahms. And still, whenever I go into Brahms today and I see this certain flavor, I think of this place. And it's chocolate toffee. You don't see it very often, but that was my favorite flavor growing up. And so I got a scoop of chocolate toffee, and we took it to Shannon Springs Park in Chickasha, Oklahoma, where I was in fourth grade, where we lived at that time. And I remember eating that ice cream and remembering I was in pretty big trouble. <laughs> it was that moment, you know, as a parent, whenever you sweeten them up with a little bit of ice cream, and then you tell them the hard truth, you know. It was a come-to-Jesus meeting, right? It was that heart-to-heart -heart that Brian uh, called the series. And in that conversation, my dad asked me gently with compassion, 
and comfort who I wanted to be and if I was on the path to get there. And don't you know that sometimes the hardest words can come in the softest package, right? Wrapped in grace, wrapped in compassion, you read the room and you realize that what this situation calls for is putting my arm around somebody and reminding them that I love them. And sometimes God calls us to do that too. Not to put people in their place, but to just to remind them we're in this together. And I'm going to do everything I can to help, even if that means being quiet. It's hard, isn't it? It's hard. And I'll be as transparent as I can this morning with you. It's hard for me. Maybe you've experienced this in life and sometimes saying the tough words and maybe even doing those with gentleness and compassion and realizing the situation, it's tough. Maybe because we're angry or maybe because we've just misread the situation. The temperature of the room, we didn't quite get. I know it's really hard right now in a world of social media, isn't it? Because we don't know the temperature of the room, even if we think we do. And sometimes maybe you've been like me. And you've spoken into the room to change the temperature. And you didn't realize that you didn't really know the temperature at all. You didn't know what other temperatures were being brought into the conversation. And all of a sudden you said something and you realized that that's not what I meant. That wasn't my intent. That didn't come out like I wanted it to. And all of a sudden, we start to realize that we didn't read the temperature in the room very well. Let me tell you, it's tough. It's tough to do. And so, proceed with caution. Proceed with caution. So here's the thing. Paul read the temperature of the room, and he said, you know what? Maybe I ought to just send you a letter now and come later. And that's what would be best for you. But for us, in addition to reading the temperature of the room and the setting that we're in, sometimes don't we need to take our own temperature? Don't we need to read the temperature of ourselves? Have you ever been there sometimes before too? Especially as a parent in that moment whenever your kid did that one more time and you were just angry. I cannot believe that he did that. I cannot believe that she did that once again. And in that moment when you respond in the heat of the moment, have you ever felt good about your response? As a parent, I've never felt good about that later. Because I was the one that needed to come back and apologize, right? You know what? You did this, and I came back with this, right? Um, And that's tough. Sometimes in parenting especially, it's easy to come back in anger and in that moment to realize that I should have just taken a time out myself so that I could get my thoughts together, so that I could get the appropriate response for the situation. I need to read the temperature of myself, and sometimes we need to do that with each other too, right? We need to look in the mirror and recognize for ourselves, is this a good time for me? For instance, am I more anxious right now because of big things that are coming up and I'm a little bit more on edge? Have I been frustrated? Have I been tired? We talked about this years ago. Am I hungry, angry, lonely, tired, that halt, right? That idea that maybe I didn't read my own temperature and I spoke into something with a tone that didn't express what really I have in my heart. And I think for all of us, we have to be careful so that we can Do what God calls us to do, but in the way that he calls us to do it. And I'm standing before you today as someone who's made that mistake many times in many situations. But I'm asking that God would help me to be better, to try to understand what that looks like, because I realize that sometimes life calls for tough words, tough love. And sometimes it calls for a severe rebuke, but other times it calls for gentleness and compassion. Romans 2, 4 says, God's kindness is what leads us to repentance. And I'm, I'm thinking of John the Baptist's words that he preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then Jesus took on that mantle in the early part of his ministry saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And yet sometimes the harsh words need to be countered with putting your arm around someone and reminding them that you love them like Paul did to the church at Corinth. That we would read the temperature of the room, but that we would also read the temperature of ourselves so that we could find consistency and appropriate response. As we wrap up today, I think of another verse that's in the Old Testament in 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 12, verse 32. And it's a brief statement of some of the men that served with David and some of the ones that just wanted to uh, fight for him and be part of his army. And in 1 Chronicles 12, 32, it mentions these men of Issachar. 
And it's a real brief thing, but it says so much in just a couple of phrases. It says that the men of Issachar, they understood the times, they understood the culture, and they knew what to do. And I remember my dad has shared that scripture several times about church leadership and saying, you know what, it's important that we understand the times and that we be the people that know what to do. But I'm going to be honest with you, that scripture intimidates me. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't understand the times. And sometimes I don't know what to do except for pray, God help me. And if we would all be honest, sometimes our quickest response isn't always correct, is it? If I said, do you understand the times? You're like, yeah, I understand the times. <laughs> and I know exactly what we should do. <laughs> My guess is, is that we're probably uh, not really understanding the times if we're that quick on the trigger. I think that that calls for me to come to God and say, God help me to understand because there's so much in this world that I don't. Help me to understand and God give me the wisdom to know what to do like Paul did with the church at Corinth. Listen, I think reading the temperature of the room and reading the temperature of ourselves is a difficult task, but it's one that we need to continue to work toward. Why? For the good of others, for the good of the church, we wanna work together, not to dominate or talk down to anyone else, not to grieve them or bring them pain or anguish, but just so that we would love them in the way that we should, praying this prayer. God, give us understanding so that we could respond as you would have us to and represent him well, reflecting his light in our world. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for this example of Paul's that reminds us that we are to slow down sometimes and be aware Lord, uh, help us to be wise enough to read the temperature of the room, to God, to be um, wise, understanding, Lord, to listen, to see, so that we could uh, represent you well. Lord, and that we wouldn't speak for ourselves, that we, but that we would reflect you in our lives. God, that's not an easy thing because sometimes we get in our own way, but God, we need your help to do that. Lord, we pray that, Lord, we would be able to represent you and speak for you in that way. Lord, humbly waiting to hear from you first. Give us wisdom. Give us grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we uh, transition into our time of invitation and then into communion, we want to just think about the grace that God has extended to us and what a blessing that that is. To know that he um, would not just withhold what we deserve in discipline, but that as his children, he would give us the riches of heaven too. Uh, what a great example. What a great example through Jesus. If you have a decision you'd like to make, whether it's joining the church, uh, accepting Christ for the first time, maybe a special prayer, then we invite you to come. There will be some leaders over here on the side that would be welcome to, uh, welcoming you to come and pray and to uh, be with them. But right now, let's stand. And if you have a decision, we invite you to come and think about God's grace for us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone. Word, my hope.
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. God who called me here below will be forever mine. Will be We have just sung about the grace of God. Listen to what Paul writes to Titus, Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, as he speaks of the grace of God. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. The world drinks to forget. The believer drinks to remember. And so today, would you remember the grace of God that wonderful, wonderful grace. And again, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all. Would you pray? Father, I thank you for this grace that is indeed so amazing. Father, I thank you that that grace gives us hope. That grace gives us redemption. And that grace is a reminder of what you have done for us. That, Father, you sent your Son to live, to die. That, Father, you rose him from the grave. And that, Father, uh, we can have life through him. And so, Father, as we uh, share in these elements, Father, help us to remember, indeed, the price that was paid and how amazing your grace is. Father, we love you. We praise you. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. As you go to take communion, you can feel free to just wait if you'd like and until the crowd dies down, but take your time with the Lord.
Thank you again so much for being here this morning, and um, I apologize for hearing me a little bit too much today. It just, these things get planned out a long ways in advance, and sometimes they, it seems like at least once or twice a year this happens, but anyway, uh, thank you for your patience in that. Um, I think I need to say to those that are watching at home, like Troy, just to raise your hand and show us that you're here, so anybody in those cameras. I think uh, sometimes when people aren't able to be here, they feel left out, you know, for whenever I take you guys' picture. So anyway, I'm not sure that technology, I can do much different than that. So, but Troy's always telling me that I can, you know, interact with him a little bit more when he's not here. So anyway, that's for him. All right. So again, thank you so much for being here this morning. couple things. Don't forget um, Keely and Trevor um, to congratulate them today as you uh, go through uh, the shower line. We, I don't, we could call it something else. We'll make up new things. I've already made up a few. So uh, anyway, the other thing I wanted to mention that I forgot to put the slide on for is that next Sunday we'll begin having Power Zone for kids in second service. And so we'll try that for just a little bit. And uh, Kristen's got some things that she's planning and the approach that she's taken for that, that'll be good uh, for the kids. And so uh, that'll include nursery and all those types of things for those parents. And so I realize for some of you that come to first service, that's um, still uh, maybe not ideal in your situation, but we're gonna offer that for second service starting next Sunday. So would you stand? Let's uh, close with prayer and hope you guys have a great rest of your day after we close. God, we thank you so much for your love. Thank you for your goodness to us. We just ask that you would um, continue to give us more and more of your grace and help us to be uh, not just recipients, but givers of that grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come thou found, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace, hear your cry to you we sing, come thou found. Of our blessing. Have a great day.